In the last video, we connected a DC generator to my rain gutter to produce hydroelectric power. We calculated there were two watts of power available, but generated less than a quarter watt. But even though the efficiency was so poor, it did work. And late one night, it finally rained enough to see it in action. First ever sustained rain. We're not quite filling up on the tube, so we don't have our full two watts, but there it is, man. It is running. This is pure rain power. Oh, I love it. I love it. <laughs> but we still don't know why we're making so little power. My guess is we're losing most of it as friction in the generator and gears. Taking the generator apart, we can see it's just a big version of the motors from part one. It makes electricity by spinning wires inside a couple of magnets. The magnets induce an electric current in the wires, an effect first identified by Michael Faraday in the early 1800s. We can't connect directly to wires that are spinning, so the generator has something called brushes that ride on these copper contacts called a commutator allowing a connection to the wires as the generator spins. But this is a source of friction and energy loss. To eliminate the need for brushes, we're going to flip this design inside out, moving the wires to the outer stationary part and the magnets to the inner rotating part. That way we can connect to the wires directly without the need for brushes. And of course, we're going to build it ourselves. I ordered some 20 by 30 millimeter neodymium magnets and got to work in CAD designing specifically around our application. Since the forces and temperatures are so low, we should be able to get away with 3D printing most of the parts. I started with the rotors so we could verify the fit of the magnets and check a few things on the lathe. What Faraday figured out is that placing a coil of wire next to a magnet doesn't have any effect. It's not until we start moving things that the wire sort of fights back against the magnetic field, inducing a current in the process. That's why we see the LED begin to light. And the faster I spin it, the brighter it gets. Now watch what happens when I add a second rotor so our coil is sandwiched between two sets of magnets. Look at that thing glow. It's even brighter even though it's at a slower speed. So why does this new set of rotors work so well? After Faraday's discovery about induction, James Maxwell came along and derived formulas for it. Thanks to him, we know induction depends on three things. The strength of the field, how fast the field changes, and the number of turns of wire in the coil. Our original generator had strong magnets, but the diameter was pretty small we'd have to spin it at twice the RPM of our new one to get the same speed on the magnetic field. Also, look how thick the wire is on the old generator. It can handle a bunch of current, but doesn't give us as many turns of wire limiting induction. I'm hoping our new generator has enough turns at a large enough diameter that we can drive it directly with a Pelton wheel, eliminating the need for gears. Now that we know this might actually work, we can print the rest of the parts and start wrapping the coils. I designed a special fixture to allow us to wrap the coils on the lathe and get them ready for installation. I even tapered the inner surface so they'll come apart easily without damaging the wire. After tacking the coil with some super glue, it's time to insert it in the stationary portion called the stator and glue it in place. But before we spend a bunch of time on the remaining coils, we ought to put it together quick and check to make sure everything's working like it's supposed to. Okay, we've got one coil installed. I just want to check this thing out and see what it does with a couple of LEDs. Let's give it a shot. I'm just going to twist it with my fingers. Ho ho! Look at that. Two LEDs. But wait a minute. Something's not quite right. Look at this thing slow down. The LEDs are alternating. Okay, I think I know what's going on, but we need to head over to the lathe to check it out. Mounted to the lathe with magnets spinning at a steady RPM, we can see the coil at the 12 o'clock position 
with two different color LEDs connected directly to it. As a magnet passes over one side of the coil, according to Faraday's law, the change in magnetic field causes a current to flow in the wires. For the sake of argument, let's say this magnet causes the current to go upward, creating a clockwise current in the coil. As the magnet continues and passes over the second side of the coil, it does exactly what it did on the first side, cause the current to go upward. But this is in direct opposition to the first current, forcing a complete reversal. Our LEDs only function in one direction, so if they're mounted with opposite polarity, they'll indicate which direction the current is flowing. Each time a magnet passes over the coil, alternating the current, the LEDs alternate as well. Until now, we've been calling this thing a generator, but due to the alternating current in the stator, it's technically an alternator. But our alternator has more than one magnet. What happens when the next magnet comes along? If it's the same polarity as the first, it's going to oppose the current of the first magnet. To prevent that, we flip its orientation so it causes a downward current matching the upward current of the first magnet. In fact, if we slow down the footage, we can see that's exactly what's happening. As long as we continue alternating the orientation of the magnets all the way around the alternator, everything works fine. The question is, will this alternating current work to charge a battery? Blowing up a balloon requires air moving in only one direction. To take a breath, we pinch the balloon to keep air from coming back out. That way, our lungs that alternate between inhaling and exhaling can be used to charge the balloon with air. Well, batteries are just like the balloon. In order to charge them, we need electricity that moves in one direction. To do that with our alternator, we're going to use diodes to rectify the alternating current. The simplest rectifier acts just like our fingers on the balloon. It only lets positive values in, eliminating anything in the minus direction. But only half the energy gets used. Ideally, we'd flip the minus values into positive. It sounds impossible, but consider this pump that exhales in both directions thanks to a clever arrangement of valves. We're going to do exactly the same thing electrically with diodes. But to demonstrate that, we need to finish assembling the alternator. I already finished the remaining coils, so it's pretty much ready to go. With our alternator fully assembled, I've installed it on the lathe with LEDs arranged to rectify the AC. Normally, you would never use diodes that emit light in a rectifier, but it allows us to follow the current visually. Let's pause it between flashes and make the wires easier to see. The first time I saw one of these, I found it really confusing. But think of it like a maze, with start and finish where the alternator connects. Current entering at start has to follow the arrows to the bottom. Circling back to the top, the shortest path to finish is through a single diode where it then returns to the alternator. As the alternator rotates, we see the current follows our exact path, lighting the LEDs along the way. When the alternating current switches directions, switch start and finish and run the maze again. Just like before, the current follows our path through the diodes, this time lighting the red LEDs instead. But check it out. The green LED at the bottom is also lit, just like before. We just ran current from opposite directions through the same LED in the same direction. That's the magic of a rectifier. Allowing it to cycle for a bit, we can see what the action of a full bridge rectifier looks like. The green LED at the bottom is called the load, where we would place our battery or whatever we want to power with direct current. But wait, wouldn't it be better if the load didn't pulse? Well, remember that balloon we were blowing up? We need a balloon for the load 
in the form of a capacitor. That evens out the pulses to a nice, steady, green, direct current. Finally, we have something that should work great to charge a battery, provided we can make enough power. All we need to do is swap the light-emitting diodes for ones that don't emit light, and we'll be good to go. I'm opting for special Schottky diodes to minimize the voltage drop and power loss from the conversion. The thing it's impossible to predict is how fast this thing is going to spin when the water's actually spraying it. So I just got to mount it up and try it out. Now low voltage was probably our biggest issue with the DC generator, so I'm wiring all four coils in series to maximize it. The 26 gauge wire we use should be large enough to handle the current, no sweat. Okay, just to see how fast this thing would spin, I hooked it up with no load at all, and measuring the voltage, we're getting almost 20 volts, it's crazy. But to be able to measure the power, we have to actually hook up a load to it. So I'm going to plug some resistors into this thing and see what we got. Okay, this is the best performance I've seen yet. We're running about a little over 5 volts and over 100 milliamps. So we're getting well over a half a watt. And I'm using quarter watt resistors, so it stands to reason. Sure enough, this thing is heating up from cold water running over our impeller. Okay, so based on the power output that I'm measuring, I've lined up a bunch of LEDs. I'm gonna light these suckers up instead of just wasting the power through a resistor. How do I do that? Like, oh yeah. <laughs> wow. Okay, uh, what kind of voltage are we running? Dang, we're almost seven volts right now. Uh, but I need to measure the current, so I gotta put, it's gonna hook up right here. And as we're gonna measure the current through these LEDs. Oh yeah. All right, let's see how our power output measures. Now that we're doing something more than just heating with it. So 90 milliamps at 6.8 volts. <laughs> that's that's 0. 0.6 watts, man. That is uh, well over half a watt. That is not bad. We're not up at our uh, uh, our one watt that we're shooting for, but that is way better. That is almost uh, three times what we were getting with our DC generator. So pretty dang cool. Okay, it's late, it's dark, and I'm sitting here under this super creepy hydro-powered light. <laughs> but I'm super excited because we got three times the power output that we've ever seen on this thing before and learned a ton about rectifiers in the process. Clearly, I'm putting a ton of time and effort into this, and if you want to see more videos like this, you need to please like and subscribe to help me grow this channel. On the next video, I'm gonna be modifying the nozzle to improve the jet as it hits the Pelton wheel, potentially making it adjustable so that we can accommodate some of the lower rain flow that we've been seeing lately. But either way, thanks for watching. I'm Quint. Hopefully I'll see you in the next video.